Good morning. So it has been a hot minute since I did any kind of morning devotional video. I can't guarantee this is going to be a long series, but uh, I've been reading through the book of Nehemiah the last week or two, just taking it bit by bit. And I, I mean, I've read Nehemiah before. I've studied through Nehemiah. I have a ton of written notes all through. I mean, look, look, this is, this is what the book of Nehemiah looks like in my, uh, in my Bible <laughs> over the years. So it's not like this is just the first time I've gone through, but it's the first time in a couple of years that I've gone through Nehemiah. And as I've been thinking about it and, and just re-studying, oh, there's so much good stuff, so much good stuff. And I wanted to just share it with you. So, you know, a few years ago, I, I did several very long, like hour long Bible studies. And then I did several, uh, we, I mean, we went all the way through the book of Isaiah together. And, and those videos are still available for our patrons on our wilderness to wild.com website. Uh, it's called the Deconstruct Patron Membership. Um, and those are weekly devotionals going through, like we turn them into workbooks and journals and just a beautiful weekly study through the book of Isaiah. Uh, but it's been a while since I've done that. And I wanted to just dig into Nehemiah this morning together with you. We're not going to get through the whole book. It's got, how many chapters does Nehemiah have? Hold on. 12 chapters, 13. 13 chapters in Nehemiah. I'm not done studying through it myself yet. But I'm about halfway there. And I thought, as I was going through it, this is such a fascinating playbook of abuse and a powerful illustration of a healthy survivor's way of handling things. Now I get it. We're not all healthy survivors. When we're in the middle of profound trauma, it's impossible to just be a healthy survivor, but we can learn from those who have been. We can learn and expand and grow and we can develop better skills as a result of, you know, of, of looking at someone else's example. Now, if you're dropping comments and stuff, I'm not able to see the comments, but I will go back and I will do my best to review them later. As you're watching this, and, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm gonna ramble this morning, I might yawn, I'm not going to, this is not pre-scripted, this is not where I've got like a major point to get to, so buckle up, get yourself a cup of coffee or something good to drink, um, hot chocolate or peppermint tea, that's probably one of my favorites, uh, and hit share. Share this on your profile with someone else who might need to, oh, thank you, I do see that one comment, love your hair, you know what, it is finally, long. like look, look, if you've been around my page for a while, you know that a couple of years ago, I had cancer and I lost all my hair. And it was like down to my waist, and then it was just like newborn baby bald, and then spiky, and then pixie, and finally, it is long enough again for me to even pull around the side. A little bit, it doesn't stay. But anyway, uh, that's the, those are huge celebrations for me, for sure. Uh, and uh, a measure of growth in my own life as my cancer is gone and my hair has grown back and that's super exciting for sure. Okay, enough introduction. Let's buckle down to it. Uh, if you want to stick around for the long haul, hit share, put it on your Facebook profile, send it to a friend. Also, grab your Bible and turn to the book of Nehemiah. And that's right after the book of Ezra. And before the book of Esther. So we're just before Psalms and Proverbs, right? And grab a blanket, something cozy, and let's let's read through this. Now I'm not gonna read every single verse because some of it is like, you know, it's important to the story and some of it, yeah, not so much. 
Okay, these are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, or Hakaliah probably would be more correct. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. So this is the setup of the whole story. Nehemiah is a, an officer, as it were, in the Persian kingdom of King Artaxerxes. Interestingly, Artaxerxes, where else have we heard the name Artaxerxes? The Book of Esther, right. So, the fortress of Susa would be the city of Shushan, right? I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. And they said to me, things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. And when I heard this, I sat down and wept. What does this tell us about Nehemiah as a person? Hmm? I'm going to see if I can, I can see the comments better. Nope, that's just to write a comment. All right. What does this tell us about Nehemiah as a person? I see, first of all, that he is someone who is concerned enough to ask about his relatives, his countrymen who have gone back. He wants an update. Second, when he hears that it's bad news, he has empathy. He sits down and he weeps. In fact, this is verse four. For days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. And then I said, so he's not just sad, he's like profoundly impacted. Then I said, and this is his prayer, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. He starts by praising God. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days, Nehemiah writes, I was the king's cupbearer. So Nehemiah is a person who is very close to the king. He's very trusted by the king and he is deeply spiritual, he's deeply conscientious, he's deeply empathic and compassionate, and a man of integrity and honor and character. Now, so he goes the following spring, this is a while later, in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign. He was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So this is weighing on him. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick, you must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified. Well, what do we know about the capricious, arbitrary tendencies of these ancient kings? Like he could have been off with his head. So I was terrified, but I replied, Long live the king. 
How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. And the king asked, well, how can I help you? Which is a direct answer to his prayer, right? Because he had said, make the king favorable to me, put it into his heart to be kind to me. And it is months later. So, I'm just looking in my footnotes here to see if, all right, so the first time that he got the news, in the month of Kislev, would have been between November and December. And when he, the king notices him being sad, would have been between April and May. So this is five, six months later. Okay. With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, please send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, that makes me wonder, who is this queen? Is this Queen Esther? Is this before or after the book of Esther? I'm actually gonna go look in the notes here because we have Esther shortly after this. This is after Esther. It comes before, Nehemiah comes before the book of Esther in scripture, but the dates are after Esther the story of Esther. So it is possible that when Nehemiah, and, and, and I'm, I'm just looking at this, I, I, I have not read theological studies or scholarly studies on this, so I did not prep to that point for this. I'm just looking in scripture at the dates given in the footnotes for the book of Nehemiah and the book of Esther. So it looks to me like it's possible, and I have to do more study on this to see what scholars say, that it could have been Esther the Queen sitting beside King Artaxerxes. It's possible. He asked, how long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I will be gone, the king agreed to my request. I also said to the king, if it please the king, now here he's planning ahead. He knows he's going to be up against some huge obstacles and barriers. If it please the king, Please have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me safely travel through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, for a house for myself. And the king granted these requests. So, okay, Nehemiah, He's the king's cupbearer. He's gotten bad news. He's waited several months. He's prayed. He's thought of this through. He's a planner. He's strategized. And now he's got his window of opportunity and he's asking for all the possible things that he could need. He's planning ahead. He's making a safety plan. Very wise of him. When I came to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, I delivered the king's letters to them. The king, I should add, had sent along army officers and horsemen to protect me, so he wasn't traveling alone. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of my arrival, they were very displeased that someone had come to help the people of Israel, introducing the abusers and those who instigate the flying monkeys for the rest of the story. Tobias, Tobiah, and Sanballat. Those are important names. So I arrived in Jerusalem. Three days later, I slipped out during the night. He's a strategic dude, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding. After dark, I went out through the valley gate, past Jackal's Well, and over to the dumb gate to inspect the broken walls and the burned gates. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't get through the rubble. So, though it was still dark, I went up the Kidron, Kidron Valley instead, inspecting the wall before I 
I turned back and entered again at the valley gate. Now, I can skip all of this. This is extra details, right? But it lays the foundation for the type of person Nehemiah is. He's thorough. He's methodical. He's thoughtful. He's a planner. He's taking steps to make sure that he doesn't do anything accidentally or sloppily. So though it was still dark, I went up the Kidron Valley instead, inspecting the wall before I turned back and entered again at the valley gate. The city officials did not know I had been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. He's able to keep it to himself until the time is right. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. And they replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. But when Tobias, Tobiah, Sanballat, and Geshem the Arab heard of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? They asked. So now they're mocking him. They're ridiculing his plans. They're laying the foundation for self-doubt, for laying doubt in the minds of others and for making it look like Nehemiah and those working with him are rebelling against the rightful authority, the civil authority, making them out to be defiant rather than following what is right. I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall but you have no share, legal right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. He's speaking faith to them, even though they are already setting up to tear him down. So, that's chapters one and two. Chapter three goes into a long list of all of the different families and who repaired which part and different repairs were made by different groups and who stood guard and how they all worked together. It's fascinating if you like historical data, it's not really germane to the story of abuse and survival and how Nehemiah handled it that we're discussing. So we're gonna skip over to chapter four. Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. Now, if someone was interested in the well-being of the people, wouldn't they be happy that the wall was being rebuilt? The only reason someone like Sandala would be upset that the wall was being rebuilt would be if the absence of the wall was beneficial to them for exploitation, for greater access to control. So when someone is upset about a boundary, when someone is furious, very angry, that you or others are setting healthy boundaries in place, that you're rebuilding your walls, that's often because those individuals benefited from there being no walls. They don't actually want you safe. They want you available for exploitation. Someone who's healthy and supportive is going to be supportive of you having good boundaries, good walls. You know that old saying, good fences make good neighbors. Uh, sometimes, and I actually have a video on YouTube about this, I think, um, Sometimes, in order to heal, you actually need to build a wall. Now, pop psychology talks a lot about tearing down walls, and sometimes we have unhealthy walls between ourselves and other people that inhibit good relationships, but other times, we need walls. 
Proverbs talks about how if a city has no wall, anything evil can flow into or out of it. So in order to protect a city, they have to, it has to have good, healthy walls. Well, Sanballat was angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage. Now listen to this and tell me if it doesn't sound familiar to anything you may have experienced yourself. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day just by offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? He doesn't sound very supportive, does he? In fact, he sounds a lot like people you may have interacted with. People who are perfectly fine with rage, with mocking, with ridicule, with shaming, with belittling, name calling. Tobiah the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, remarked, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. I think it's very fascinating, actually, how detailed the book of Nehemiah is in quoting the conversation. Not often in scripture do we get actual quotes from what people said, much less uh, <laughs> their cynical, ridiculing quotes of conversation. There's a, there's a lot of narrative in this historical book. So they're basically just swapping insults, right? At the third party, at Nehemiah and the Jews. Then I prayed, Nehemiah prays, hear us, O God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger right here in front of the builders. It's a bit of an imprecatory prayer. Basically, God, call down all of the punishments on them that they deserve, please. At last, the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people worked with enthusiasm. But... The story's not done. When Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and Ammonites and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. Now, why would they have wanted there to be no wall? So they could continue to exploit those who lived there. So they could continue to feel more powerful. They didn't want any boundaries keeping them out and limiting their power and control over the Jewish refugees that had returned. So, they all, this verse 8 of Nehemiah chapter 4, they all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and we guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. So, Nehemiah led the people who were there working in two parts one well three three parts prayer and surrender to god and trusting that god would protect them two active strategic planning and protection plans three active rebuilding of the wall there's three parts prayer and surrender faith protection and strategic planning and active growth and rebuilding to heal. Three aspects that translate over quite beautifully to survivors who are rebuilding now. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired. You ever felt tired when you're in this kind of situation? There is so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. So they're at a point where they're getting exhausted, fatigued, because they're having to do all the things. They're having to plan. They're having to strategize. They're having to protect. And they're having to rebuild, as well as survive. It's a heavy load. 
it is traumatizing. It is, it is exhausting, draining. And in the meantime, they know that their enemies, those who want to destroy them, are planning their demise. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families. The whole family got involved with this armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then, as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people, and I said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord, who is great and glorious, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated those plans, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. So Nehemiah divided his resources between protection and rebuilding. He didn't focus all on protection and no rebuilding, and he didn't focus all on rebuilding and no strategic protection. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. I cannot think of any better illustration of that long slog when you have escaped an abusive situation, when you're living in hypervigilance and fear, but you're still trying to protect your children perhaps, you're trying to navigate family court. You're trying to figure out how to heal and live safely and rebuild. It's an exhausting state of being. That's actually why we have created the Trauma Mamas app and the Sisterhood Community, which is a whole different thing. I'll drop a link to that below. But that's where we have trauma tools and trauma recovery tips safety, strategic tips, expert interviews, the whole works. Um, but I digress. <laughs> so here we have the laborers working with one hand, holding a weapon with the other hand, always ready for battle. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeter stayed with me to sound an alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and officials and all the people, the work is very spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding, and our God will fight for us. Now, oftentimes, I, I work with cases where women are experiencing this same kind of fear and exhaustion and stress and trauma and hypervigilance from the court system, from trying to stay safe after leaving a very dangerous, escalating situation. And um, they, they worry that it's, it's wrong to strategize. Maybe they should just focus on healing. Or maybe they're so exhausted, they, they don't feel like they have anything, that, any bandwidth to do anything except just surviving. And I completely understand that. But I, I think it's really important to recognize here that it is okay to claim my God will fight for me and to also, figuratively speaking, strap a sword on your belt and do the work of rebuilding. It's okay to do all of the things, to strategically plan, to take action for protection, and to work on healing and rebuilding and to do all those things while trusting that God will fight the battle. Nehemiah 4, verse 21. We worked early and late from sunrise to sunset and half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay inside Jerusalem. That way they and their servants could help with guard duty at night and work during the day. During this time, this is, this is huge, you guys. During this time, 
None of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me, ever even took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. I'm going to stop there, and we're going to pick up next time in chapter 5 of Nehemiah. Maybe I can do that tomorrow morning. We'll see. I would love to hear your thoughts on this just so far. Just laying the foundation, setting up the story, and the way that Nehemiah handled this journey through hypervigilance and rebuilding and strategizing. What does this say to you? How does this encourage you? What questions does it raise? Drop your comments underneath. And if you have hung out with me this far, which I see a whole lot of you have, thank you for being here with me this far. Um, definitely hit share, pass this on to someone else. Tell me what you think. We'll go through this, the rest of it again. <laughs>